My final thoughts, injury update, and predictions for Sunday night are all coming your way today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, folks, it's time for our last conversation before the Buffalo Bills face the Baltimore Ravens Sunday night football in Baltimore. Bills have a chance to get to 4-0. and Ravens have a chance to get to 1-3. and Would like to win this game. Let's uh, get into my final thoughts here. We'll talk to Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills about the injuries, and we got some information on Taron Johnson. Terrell Bernard actually practiced this past week, and then, of course, the Tylen Grable situation, and we'll close things out with my five predictions for Sunday night. First, a couple of newsy items. Uh, first of all, I think I acknowledge this, but I'm not sure if I did. Josh Allen named AFC Offensive Player of the Week for his performance last week against the Jacksonville Jaguars. So three weeks. Three different Buffalo Bills players have been named AFC Player of the Week. Uh, We had Greg Rousseau, we've had James Cook, and now we've had Josh Allen. Who's it going to be this week? Hopefully there is a fourth in a row. We'll find out. All right, some newsy stuff here. Offensive lineman Tylen Grable, Bills' late-round draft pick, who has become the starting swing tackle for this team, has been placed on injured reserve with a core muscle injury. Going to talk all about that with Dr. Kyle Trimble in the next segment, but he's going to be out for a while. And in his place, they elevated offensive lineman Will Clapp from the practice squad to the 53 man roster. And so Brandon Bean said uh, during final cuts that Will Clapp was the 54th player, right? They, they were, he was the last guy that they wound up uh, letting go and they signed him back to the practice squad. Now he's back on the active roster. Gives the Bills uh, an interior offensive lineman uh, that can fill a reserve role. But I think really the win here is that you have Alec Anderson as this jumbo tight end, this six offensive lineman that plays a decent amount of snaps every game. And so you can preserve that if you do need to have uh, someone in the middle three uh, come out for an injury or something like that. So Will Clapp giving you a veteran that can play center and guard. And then, you know, I think the good news about where the Bills are at from an offensive line depth perspective is that they do have Ryan Vandemark, uh, who was the Bills' swing tackle last year, uh, the first in behind Dawkins and Brown. He's right back into that role right now, and he's on a great path. Uh, Tylen Grable is also on a great path, and so um, good problem to have with two good young tackles, and uh, for now it'll be Ryan Vandemark's opportunity to be that first guy in now with will clap coming off of the practice squad and going to the active roster the bills had an active spot on the practice squad left to fill and they did that with a wide receiver uh Amarin brown uh, was signed to the practice squad he's five foot eight 170 pounds ran four three seven in the 40 yard dash 23 years old undrafted free agent out of south carolina spent the offseason with the browns and um didn't have a very productive college career, but I'm sure the speed is what's attractive here for Buffalo. And they've got several guys with speed on the practice squad at wide receiver. And so they worked him out a few weeks ago, must have liked what they saw. And uh, now he's on this practice squad. And, you know, the Bills have a healthy amount of receivers on the practice squad. I think it's four. And part of that you'd think is because they only have five receivers on the active roster. So you want to kind of beef up your practice squad, but also. I'm sure those types of players are very useful in navigating the week when it comes to scout team players. You know, you need to have different players that you can put in for scout team looks at receiver, running back, quarterback, cornerback, safety. I'm sure uh, these types of players are helpful in providing good looks to the Bills 
uh, players that are going to be playing in the upcoming game. All right, that's out of the way. I want to get into my final thoughts on this game in particular. And I think, you know, this is Josh Allen versus Lamar Jackson, right? But I think both defenses are in for unique challenges this week. And I tried to talk about this in the primer episode that I did yesterday, and I don't really love the way that it came out. And so I kind of want to build upon that and, and really try to hammer down what I'm trying to communicate. Let's talk about the Ravens defense and where I think they're very stressed going up against Buffalo. Well, Ravens have given up the most passing yards in the NFL. They've given up the mo- uh, fifth most passing yards per attempt. They've given up the most pass plays of 20 yards or more. They're 22nd in EPA per pass play allowed. And their coverage has been leaky. That's not hard to figure out that that's been the case. And so where I think the Ravens are having issues is that they're very multiple with how they play their back seven personnel. They'll play three safeties. They'll play different slot guys. Sometimes it'll be Kyle Hamilton. Sometimes it'll be Marlon Humphrey going from outside corner to inside corner. Sometimes they leave Marlon Humphrey at outside corner. They bring in our Darius Washington, who's more of a reserve player. They like to play the matchups. And I think because of that, they have a lot of different personnel on the field. And when you're trying to communicate and and be consistent and, you know, uh, defend different looks that are coming your way. I just don't think you have a lot of time on task with the same personnel groupings. And so I think that's caused some issues, not only because of the interchangeable parts, but because of the massive coaching staff turnover that Baltimore's had on the defensive side of the football. In addition to, you know, they had a lot of players that were part of that back seven last year that are no longer around. Ronald Darby, Geno Stone, Arthur Mollet, Rocky Sin, just a lot of different players that played uh, working in new pieces with new coaching, right? You can understand why they've had some issues because on paper, it looks like Baltimore has good secondary talent and good back seven talent, but it's not playing well together. Well, I think that's those are your contributing factors. Now, where Baltimore has been the most vulnerable with their defense in their past defense has been defending slot targets. They're giving up 103 yards per game to slot targets, which is third most in the NFL, and they're 23rd in EPA per pass play when targeting slot receivers against their defense, right? So they're having issues uh, defending the slot, which ties back to everything I just said about the interchangeability and trying to figure out the right mix of personnel that they want to roll with. Well, the good news is the Bills' best pass-catching options play from the slot. Khalil Shakir, Dalton Kincaid. And the Bills have a commanding lead in offensive EPA when throwing the ball to slot options, 0.94 EPA per play. Number two is 0.61. I mean, this is a commanding lead. The Bills are great at throwing the ball to their slot options. And so I think this is quite the conflict for Baltimore, who struggled to defend the thing the Bills are really good at. And it's funny, this past week in the Discord channel, uh, I was interacting with a bunch of fans, and we were talking about who's the most important offensive weapon for the Bills that's not named Josh Allen. And uh, we had three options in the poll. It was James Cook, Dalton Kincaid, and Khalil Shakir. And Khalil Shakir won the poll. I think 60% of people voted for Khalil Shakir, and I think both Kincaid and Cook came in around 20%. To me, it is Shakir. I think Shakir is the most important offensive weapon for this football team, and um, this is a great opportunity for the Bills to showcase that uh, against Baltimore. Now, for the Bills' defense, they got their own problems to figure out. Um we kind of talked about this, but again, I don't think I, I communicated this as well as I wanted to. Lamar Jackson and his frequency of throws, short to intermediate, so within about 19 yards of the line of scrimmage, this, that's where he works the football, right? He's not throwing anything deep. He's not having success with anything deep. He's not really throwing the ball outside the numbers. He's throwing the ball to the middle of the field, short to intermediate, which is quite the difference from all of the Bills' previous opponents. And of course, you think about the two new safeties, all backups on the second level at slot, middle linebacker and weak side linebacker. You know, other teams haven't done a good enough job, in my opinion, of attacking that piece of the Bills defense. Baltimore's going to, I think. I'll give you some numbers here. Short to intermediate throws, Lamar Jackson, 153.9 passer rating, has a perfect 158.3 passer rating when throwing the ball between the numbers in the short to intermediate area of the field. And that's honestly where the ball should be going. 
And we talk, this is one of the things I'm trying to really nail down for everyone this year on this podcast is understanding coverage shells and where that means the football should go. If you get two high safeties, that means middle of the field open, the ball should go to the middle of the field if you're the quarterback. If you get one high safety, that's middle of the field closed, ball should go outside. Well, the Ravens have seen the fifth most two high middle of the field open coverage, and they face the fifth least one high middle of the field closed coverage. Lamar's throwing the ball where he should. Meanwhile, the Bills play the third least one high middle of the field closed coverage, and they play the third most two high middle of the field open coverage. Can the Bills live in this world? Do they need to play differently? Do they need to be able to tap into more one high looks and bring down a low safety, not only to help defend that area of the middle of the field against the pass because you have more bodies, but also you get an extra player down in the run fit, right? I, I feel like the Bills kind of have to, right? Like structurally, all the rules of football would tell you you should play more one high middle of the field close coverage. Will the Bills do that? I don't know, but I think they should think about it. But then there's also that other piece of this conversation that's, well, it's not really the thing you've done. Do you really want to reinvent structurally how you play defense for this game? We'll see. Hopefully Bobby Babich has the right answers. And then I think the the concerns for the Bills defense continue when you talk about the run defense, where everyone knows Baltimore can run the ball. Lamar Jackson, Derrick Henry, 5.9 yards per carry. That's the most in the NFL, second in total rushing yards and EPA per rush. And they run the ball with big people. 77% of their run plays are either two backs or two tight ends on the field. They run the ball with big people on the field. The Bills don't put big people on the field on defense. Zero snaps this season with three linebackers. 79% nickel, 21% dime. And the Bills are presenting neutral or light boxes, so seven or less in the box to opponents on 90% of snaps. Can they live in this world against Baltimore? Do they need to play with three linebackers? Do they need to have more aggressive boxes in terms of loading up on the box to help defend the run? Again, they haven't, but will they? Can they live in the world that they have to this point against Baltimore? And so I think both defenses are very stressed in unique ways. You know, even you think about the Ravens and how good their run defense has been. Okay, you played the Chiefs, the Raiders, in Dallas. None of those teams can run the ball. And quite honestly, I think two of them don't want to run the football. And how skewed are their metrics running the ball because of that? You know, the Bills are going to want to run the ball. So it's it's a very I think both defenses have to figure out some new things for this game, and I like that for the Bills. Uh, they have Sean McDermott and Bobby Babbitt, Janelle Holcomb, and a rock star defensive coaching staff, and I'm not saying that Baltimore doesn't have good defensive coaches, but they do have a 32-year-old defensive coordinator that lost a bunch of key members of that defensive staff. Mike McDonald, the D.C. last year, head coach in Seattle. Denard Wilson uh, is a defensive coordinator in Tennessee. Anthony Weaver, the defensive coordinator in Miami. You know, it's it's um, it's not a very experienced group together. And so I like where the Bills are at in a game where I think defensive adjustments are going to be paramount, not only in-game, but having the right idea going into it. I think the Bills are really positioned to be able to handle that. So I think that's a really key storyline of this game overall. And hopefully this segment was able to communicate that to you in the ways that I've tried to at other times throughout the course of this week. All right, folks, coming up on the other side of it, Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills. He's going to get us ready to go to, for this game from an injury perspective. Please be sure to stick with me. With Robin Hood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robin Hood Gold allows you to get the rates and perks usually reserved for the high society. Now the resourceful individual with Robin Hood Gold can earn a rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of a high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for only $5 a month. The new, new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. Terms apply for product-specific disclosures. Visit Robinhood.com slash gold. Investing involves risk. Rate may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold, LLC. All right, folks. Prize Picks is America's number one 
fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. Prize Picks is the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Unlike other apps, Prize Picks just puts you against the numbers. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is also the only real daily money fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy so that way your lineup stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On NFL to get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's Locked On NFL on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. I'm joined now by Kyle Trimble. He's a doctor of physical therapy. He runs bangedupbills.com. You can follow him on Twitter at bangedupbills. He joins us each week to get ready for the upcoming Bills game from an injury perspective. And fortunately, there's not a whole lot of new stuff to get into. We'll get into Tylen Grable and him going on injured reserve. But I think the most interesting stuff this week, Kyle, is really just some updates on some players that have been hurt and maybe some progress. I want to start with Taron Johnson. Uh, Joe Biscalia was able to speak to him this past week and gave us an update on what the injury is. And so can you break that down for us and tell us what that means about his return to the field? Yep. So uh, Joe B had managed to find out that he did, that Johnson did indeed crack his forearm. Um, now keep in mind, there's two bones in the forearm, the radius and ulna based off of how he hit, um, or at least that he was hit by Taylor Rapp early in the first quarter of week one. Um, is more likely that the ulna, which is the bone that connects your um, to your wrist and then to your elbow, that's what makes the actual um, elbow joint there along with the humerus. So just give us some frame of reference when you're looking at it. So it's on the pinky side, which is where I think he probably more or less suffered the fracture. Um, it's interesting that they said it's cracked, which means it's broken, but it's non-displaced, which means it's not movable. If it had been displaced or it was broken multiple areas, he would have undergone surgery and probably been out longer duration. But the fact it's cracked, it said that, hey, yes, it is technically a broken bone, but it's not moving around. And if they don't have to do surgery, that's usually always better unless there's some type of instability or something that could cause further problems down the line. So the Bills, I think, were smart to not put him on injury reserve because they said, hey, this is a pretty straightforward fracture. We just have to let the body heal up. Um, broken bones certainly have a lot more um, straightforward timeline than we see with sometimes nerve injuries or even uh, soft tissue like your hamstrings or calf and whatnot. So they said four or six weeks from the time of injury. I know that he had talked about the possibility of it coming back in week five. I think it's going to come down to just how well the bone's healing and then when he starts initiating contact, what he can do with all that there. Um it's, it's great that Joe B did get that because sometimes we don't get those scoops or we hear about it months later well after the fact. So I do appreciate Joe if he's listening that uh, he got that. But it also just tells us how nuanced some of these injuries are because, you know, we weren't getting any information. We didn't see any signs of uh, surgery. He wasn't going on IR. So we really didn't have a lot to go off of other than there's a direct blow to the, the forearm. But that could have been, you know, more soft tissue, could have been a lot more nerve. I mean, at least we have no idea what's going on. And then once he does return, he will return with a brace. There really shouldn't be any lingering problems. Uh, he could break it again later, but that's with any bone. I mean, once you return, mm -hmm. you could always have that happen again. So um, glad we got some updates on it. It's pretty straightforward, and it just comes back down to when he can come back and you know run around and do whatever. But they want to make sure that he doesn't return back too quickly, and then he were to suffer a more serious break, and then he's out for a longer duration. Sounds like maybe best case scenario with, with Taryn and what the possibilities could be. So it found, sounds like everything's trending in a good direction. It's probably within the next two weeks that we should see him back on the field, it seems like at least. Let's talk about Terrell Bernard. Uh, a lot of good momentum here. We Of course, he's been missing time with the pectoral injury, but he actually practiced in a limited capacity on Thursday and Friday, and there's been some video as well of him doing different drills. And so, of course, I'd love to hear from you on what you've seen from those videos and Maybe any clues as to how his rehab and return, what how that's all shaping up. I liked what I saw on Thursday. Um, we had a lot of the different beat reporters uh, highlighting what he was doing out there. A lot of him was that uh, uh, blocking dummy and then the, the tackling dummy and then everything else that went into that. And he was swatting balls. Uh, Alex Brasky of the Batavia Daily News got a great shot on him, though. So he had the left shoulder harness on, which is we see often after uh, labral repairs or injuries. And then they've also used that for pectoral injuries, too. 
And the idea behind this is this reduces the ability to get into full abduction and external rotation, which does place stress on the pectoral muscle, which is how he injured the area in the first place. So they want to make sure that that's not getting overstretched, but the fact that he was able to engage in his block in front and then even wrap around the tackling um, dummy or whatever else it's, it's called there. Um, it's not against live action though. So, I mean, it's a stationary object. It's good that he's doing that in the right direction. He says he feels good, but the key thing is, can he do this against moving targets? Can he do this against something that's going to give him resistance? Can he do this against, you know, people that are going to try to get away from him? So live action reps are going to be really where we would see that progress. So even though, you know, he's talking about, he wants to get back in week five, we'll see what happens with this. The only reason I'm a little hesitant about this is because we saw Matt Milano back in 2020 suffer the same injury. He returned in two games and he just struggled. And I think they kept him going until they could get him on injury reserve and use the bye to help his recovery there. And his injury might have been more severe, but I also don't think that they want to get Bernard out there. Then tweaks and then he's kind of in the same process where, hey, we have to get you back on IR because this thing had a setback there. So um, while I do like his progress so far, I'm also cautiously, cautiously optimistic because I don't want them to rush him back out there, especially, I mean, if they take care of the the Ravens and then, okay, maybe we keep him out a little bit longer, have you know, week six with the, against the Jets there and have that Monday extra time. So I like what I'm seeing, but I also don't think they need to rush him given the record and the injury and past uh, examples. Yeah, especially if, I mean, Bale Inspector and Dorian Williams are going to continue to do a good job in replace of him. Make sure he's ready to go, right? Don't uh, put him out there in a situation where you're not sure and he's not what he's supposed to be. Spend the benefit of this depth and how well it's played to this point. Uh, exactly. Real- um, I do have one extra thing I was thinking about when mm-hmm. you talk about that. When Milano did return in 2020, he was just on passing downs. He was really restricted on what he could do. I think if you want to get Bernard back in there, you want to make sure you can do everything. You, you don't want to tip the, the hand of the defense either. So just some, something I thought about after the fact. So maybe they take extra time, make sure you can do everything instead of limiting himself to certain um, defensive packages especially as a Mike linebacker where there's just going to be more contact playing uh, in the middle of the defense there. Kyer Elam, we won't spend any time here because he has no game day designation. I do want to acknowledge that he uh, was limited in practice on Wednesday and Thursday with a neck injury, practice in full on Friday, no game day designation. But unfortunately, we do have a player that has joined the injured reserve list. It's rookie offensive tackle Tylen Grable, who is the primary swing tackle. He beat out Ryan Vandemark for that job. And um, I guess the good news is that the Bills do have Ryan Vandemark, who was the swing tackle last year. So you feel still feel good about the depth there. And they bring up Will Clapp, who provides more offensive line depth off the practice squad. But Tylen Grable, a good-looking young rookie, had a great preseason, like we mentioned, beat out Tylen Grable to be the swing tackle. Or excuse me, beat out Ryan Vandemark to be the swing tackle. He had a, a groin injury, a core muscle injury. What uh, what did you see on this? And you know how long do you think this is going to be? So he went in when they pulled the starters and this was about midway through the fourth quarter around nine, eight minutes left there. And it wasn't clear when it happened because one of the, the plays that it possibly could have happened was it was off screen and I was able to look at the all 22 at that time. So it, I think it happened though, that there was a play off to the left side of the field. He kind of lost his footing, was trying to maintain it and stepped funny on his right leg before he fell down. And then you saw the next two plays every time he'd get up or he's trying to run, he was like trying to adjust around where uh, his groin was out on the right side. Like it was almost like you're like when you're a guy, you're trying to adjust yourself. That's the best way to describe it. Um, So that's what I'm seeing on film. And that says a groin injury. And then um, he ended up going out and then didn't return. They ruled him out, which wasn't surprising given the score and everything else with that. But then the designation, the core muscle, they use that with Nick Morrow during the summertime. Now, when they used that with Nick Morrow, um, he had had a gr- uh, core muscle repair in the springtime uh, when they signed him. And that wasn't known until Bjorn and Bean said that in August. So his was fine and he hasn't been on the injury report since then. But the fact that they used a core muscle designation along with the groin, the groin tells you that that's where the injury is at in terms of the overall core. And then the uh, core muscle injury tells you that there's probably a tear in there. So I wouldn't be surprised if he does require surgery. And the fact that he says he'd be out for some time, you know, they put him on injury reserve. Uh, there's a great place down in Philadelphia, the Vincera Institute. The, the Dr. William Myers does great work with core muscle repairs. They have great outcomes. It's just a matter of just getting that area repaired. Otherwise, he's going to lose a lot of power with trying to push off the right leg, any lateral movements he has to do, and he's just going to constantly be nursing an injury. So 
given that he's a rookie, he plays tackle. They probably just said, let's get you repaired. And then the average time for a guy to suffer a core muscle injury with a surgery and uh, return to play is about 60 days or, or two months there. So we could see him return if he's needed to later on. But the fact that we have Ryan Vandermark, who has experience in the system and already knows what to do, is great that they can give him the time to heal up and they're not really having a huge drop off. All right. Hashtag no new injuries. That's always our <laughs> motto here whenever we get done talking to Dr. Kyle Trimble. It's been pretty good, right? You had some big injuries to start the year. Milano, Johnson, Bernard. Of course, we've been talking about Josh Allen's hands, but it does it does feel like things have normalized a bit. This team has hit its stride. Let's hope that continues. As always, we greatly appreciate you sharing your expertise. Absolutely. Go Bills. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. And look, the Bills right now, two and a half point underdogs to the Baltimore Ravens. You think they're going to win the game? Go to FanDuel and get in on that money line. Check it out. That's FanDuel.com to download America's number one sportsbook. All right, folks, let's close it out with my predictions for the week. Before we get there, I would love to extend an invitation to you to join the Locked On Bills subtext community. And first of all, let me say this because there's been some confusion. It is 100% me. I am sending text messages. I am typing up these text messages I'm sending them to you. It is me. There's no AI. There's nobody else. It comes from me, and I love doing it. Interacting with Bills Mafia is one of the passions of my life, and this is one of my favorite ways to do it is through the subtext community. What is it? Well, it's a situation where I send you text messages. You get my first reaction to all Bills news, so no need to scroll social media all day. If there's Bills news, I'm sending it right to you on your phone and giving you my first reaction to the news. You also get my in-game texts. So when the Bills and Ravens are playing on Sunday night, you're going to get a text from me probably after every single drive, letting you know how I'm feeling, what I'm seeing, what I'm hoping to see. And we've had a lot of fun so far this year. A lot of uh, all caps, a lot of all exclamation points as we've enjoyed some really fun Bills wins. You also get my all 22 film file. After the Bills game, I send out, I spend the entire next day studying the game film. And then I put together, I don't know, it's been between 30 and 40 minutes of clips where I'm breaking down things that I'm seeing that tell the story of the game, the big plays, how the game plans were implemented, and you get you know that sent right to your phone, uh, usually the day right after the game. And you also get access to our Discord community, which I love so much. We're building a lot of community around this podcast through the Discord channel, and um, it's you know there's almost 1,200 Bills fans in there. We're talking Bills, Sabers, life, you know whatever you want to get into. There's channels to talk about it. But we also do exclusive things. Um, this coming Wednesday night, we're having easy Bills trivia. Last Wednesday night, we did um, a memorabilia contest where people came in and brought and showed like their most unique Bills memorabilia. We've got events. We've got betting stuff. We've got member spotlight stuff. Tons of, of cool things. In addition to just having discourse, there's very exclusive things that happen just for that Discord channel. It is blowing up. So be part of that as well. You get into the Discord with a subtext subscription or a sub stack subscription. I have started writing articles, and next week's going to be a big week on the sub stack. Five articles coming your way. You get my post game column, you get Josh Allen weekly, you get my scouting preview for Bills Texans, but also next week I'm giving the Bills first quarter report card, and I'm going to update all of my player grades for the Bills. So if there's been changes, you're going to see an article on that. So great time to get in on either or both the sub stack or the sub text. There's a link in today's show notes to be part of either. All right, let's get into the predictions. Got five of them for you. Some interesting stuff this week. We'll start off with this one. Number one, I predict that neither Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen throws an interception this game. No quarterback interceptions. Josh hasn't thrown one yet this year. I think Lamar has one, but both of these players have been tremendous at providing big plays for their offenses, but also taking care of the ball. Their turnover-worthy throw percentages are extremely low. I think that it's more likely that they fumble and have a turnover than it is that they throw an interception. So I don't see an interception coming from either quarterback in this game. Number two, a lot of talk about the tight ends for both of these teams. You know, Bills have Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox. 
The Ravens have Isaiah Likely and Mark Andrews. I predict that the Bills tight ends in this game have more receiving yards than the Ravens tight ends. And um, the Ravens defense has not been very good at stopping tight ends. They've given up 280 yards in three games to tight ends. That's second most in the NFL uh, behind the Chiefs. The Chiefs have actually given up the most by a lot. Number two is Baltimore. The Bills have only given up 124 yards to tight ends, which is middle of the pack, 15th in the NFL. I think Kincaid, Knox, and Morris outproduce likely Andrews and Kolar. Number three, I think that the Bills give up the fewest rushing yards this season to Baltimore. They've had some good rushing games, 185 yards to Kansas City, 151 to Las Vegas, 274 last week to Dallas. I think the Bills give up 150 or less rushing yards to Baltimore. Um, I'm excited to see how they do it. <laughs> I, I think there'll be some unique ideas from Bobby Babich and Sean McDermott on how to play their fronts, but I don't I don't foresee Baltimore just running the ball all over the Bills. I think the Bills will give up some run runs for sure. I think they'll give up probably over 100 yards rushing. I don't think it's more than 150. So put me down for the fewest rushing yards on the season for Baltimore. Number four, I think that the Bills gain the most rushing yards yet this year against Baltimore. Baltimore's run defense has been awesome. We talked about it already. They gave up 72 to Kansas City, 27 to Las Vegas, and 51 to Dallas. I think the Bills will put out the most yards yet this year on the ground against Baltimore. So they need 73 yards to do that. I think they'll comfortably take care of that. And I think the Ravens have a good front. I think they're a very good run defense. But I don't think it's this impossible situation that it might feel like. And I think those situations have been game script dependent. Um, and I think that it's three different teams that, I mean, quite honestly, don't really want to run the ball in, in Kansas City and Dallas. And then Vegas wants to run the ball. They just can't. They have too many new pieces on their offensive line. And I'm not sure the running back talent is good enough. And I don't think they have the quarterback that's going to pull defenders out of the box and concern anybody from – uh, stopping their passing game. So uh, I think the Bills will have a decent day running the ball against a great Baltimore run defense. Put me down for 73 or more yards on Sunday night. Lastly, do I think the Bills win this game or do they find their first loss of the season? Folks, earlier this week when I was on FanDuel and I saw that the Bills were uh, underdogs and uh, two and a half point underdogs, I immediately went in and said, put me down for the Bills and the money line. I think the Bills win this game. I think they have a lot of momentum. I think that Josh Allen is playing at an extremely high level. They're figuring things out on defense. And quite honestly, if the Bills invite Baltimore to a shootout, I don't think they can hang. I don't. I think the Baltimore Ravens need the game to go a certain way in terms of can they grind it out with rushing yards? Can they be opportunistic on defense? Can they value possessions? Um, I don't think they can be in a situation where they have to play from behind. Um, I don't think Lamar Jackson – is the type of quarterback that's going to win in a dropback style passing game. I think what makes Lamar Jackson Lamar Jackson is the dual threat nature of his skill set, the run game and how he can extend plays and play outside of structure and stress defenses that way. And he's also a good thrower of the football as well, but I think he needs both of those components to really be the overall package. If you can force Lamar Jackson into a dropback passing game, which the Bills have done to Miami and Jacksonville, their last two opponents, I think it's going to be a tough day for Baltimore. I don't think the Bills are going to blow them out. I'm not saying that, but I think that they'll be able to put Baltimore in a bit of a chase mode, and uh, that will result in a Bills win. So put me down for the Bills getting to 4-0, and entering into Week 5 against the Houston Texans. Of course, we'll be here every step of the way to break down what happens after the game and get you ready for Houston in Week 5. But for this week, folks, the hay is in the barn. We've done all we can to get ready for this game. The only thing that's left to do is for the Buffalo Bills to go out there and score more points in the Baltimore Ravens and get that fourth win of the season. Again, tons of post-game coverage coming your way uh, on Bleacher Report. I'm going three days a week on Bleacher Report in October, immediately after the game. We'll do a, a day-after stream and a midweek stream. So make sure you're following me on Bleacher Report. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of content there. And then, of course, all week here on Locked on Bills, the Substack, the Subtext. Be part of all of it, folks. Got a lot of things going on. As always, I kindly ask that you rate, review, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And we look forward to catching up with you after the game.